The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey, Elliot, what's up? <laughs> what's up, Ben? I, I just got like early 2000 flashbacks to that Budweiser campaign. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that Budweiser, yeah. It, it's, it's a sticky campaign. Still, uh, still stays it's, with it's me. It's still going on. Yeah. <laughs> we just lost every millennial listening to us right and now. And Gen like, Z. What? Well, Gen Z doesn't yeah, care. Gen Z. Yeah, they're just like, what, what the hell are you guys talking about? So, anyway, welcome back to another fantastic cinematography podcast. We got a, uh, a great show today. On the show, we have a creative team behind the new movie, which is just getting released, uh, called Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul. All uh, right. I, I, I'm, I'm going to go do that right now. I'm, gonna, I'm running out to my car. Oh, okay, great. I guess I'll see you in a couple hours then. We'll, we'll, All right, we'll bye. 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 Okay, so uh, Honk for Jesus. Ironically, I drive a Kia Soul, so that actually works. <laughs> That's true. Your soul has now been saved. But uh, on the mm. show is the writer-director Adama Ibo and her sister Adane Ibo and their cinematographer Alan Gwizdowski, which was great. I had a, a wonderful sit down with them. And uh, the movie stars Regina Hall and Sterling oh, K. Uh, Brown. And if you are interested, uh, that's quite know, a cast. Definitely check it out. Yeah. Uh, so, so Ben, what is our close focus today? Actually, even before close focus, I wanted to send out a personal congratulations to our great friend Checo Varese. Oh yeah, friend who of just the show. won an Emmy. He just won a he just won a freaking Emmy for Dope Sick. Yeah, well, you know, well, well deserved. Congratulations, Checo. Uh, you know, I think he still might be in the lead too for the guest we've had on the show more than anybody else. So uh, I think we've had him on three times. Three times. Well, it's, I think it was three or four, something like that. So I don't. Maybe know. maybe it was four. Wonderful guy and Dope Sick, just uh, a buzzworthy, awesome show starring uh, Michael Keaton. So check it out. Definitely. Okay, so on to close focus. Uh, our close focus today concerns a really interesting story that you found in Variety about Saudi Arabia launching a 40% film production rebate initiative. Who doggy? Wow. <laughs> how, how to unpack this? Clearly, Saudi Arabia wants Hollywood dollars coming to the kingdom to shoot their next movie. But don't don't the people, by and large, who make movies run completely contrary to the morals and values of the Saudi Arabian government? Yeah, I'd say that it's going to be an interesting choice of which producers and productions flee from Los Angeles, California and set up shop in Saudi Arabia. But, you know, money does have a way of uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, greasing the wheels, so to speak. I, I understand. It, it looks, I mean, it looks like some productions have already done this, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and it looks like in 2017, they kind of lightened up certain restrictions around doing stuff there. But uh, it's interesting, like, I mean, uh, Saudi Arabia is just um, honestly a country I don't really understand at all. I don't understand anything about Saudi Arabia. I feel like if you were to drop me on Saudi in Saudi Arabia, I would feel like I was on another planet. Women don't drive. Uh, there are public beheadings. Uh, am I missing anything? It's, it's very religious. And basically, it's a series of, they don't call them oligarchs, but a series of very rich princes kind of run everything. Like, it's not a democracy. Average people don't have rights. Am I, am I missing something here? Uh, you know, I'll just use this as an opportunity to say that I'm not sure that the dissident would qualify for that 40 <laughs> percent tax rebate and i think it's on netflix now so oh, uh, if you haven't yeah. seen the dissident the, then the dissident uh, it's about jamal khashoggi who uh, M mbs <laughs> mohammed ben salman but also known as mr bonesaw uh uh mur had him murdered and cut up at the saudi embassy in Turkey. Yeah, that's right. Um, and if you haven't seen The Dissident, which, you know, uh, was shot by Jake Swanko, also one of the producers who we've had on the show now a couple of times. And absolutely, you should check out all of the uh, Swanko shot movies. I'm also including Icarus. But if you liked Icarus, I think you'll definitely like The Dissident and you should uh, get all over that. And I think that will be a wonderful uh, reminder of about uh, of Saudi Arabia and what's <laughs> what MBS does over there that yeah, uh, yeah, that's an interesting time. But interesting, like uh, in this article, they they talk about there were three movies that have been made there: Kandahar with mm -hmm. uh, Gerard Butler, 
Desert Warrior, which stars Anthony Mackie. And, mm-hmm. and it was filmed in a city called Neom. It's a futuristic city being built in the Tabuk province in northwestern Saudi Arabia, like a city built to be a science fiction story. And then the last one was the Russo brothers. Uh, they made a crime drama called Cherry, which was that's out already. Yeah, that's out. Yeah, yeah. and, uh, and uh, they're all made in Saudi Arabia. And you know, it's like on the one hand, it's like, hey, I bet I bet it looks different. I bet you get some interesting different looks. Also, I'm sure the Saudi people are wonderful people. I'm not down on the Saudi people at all. I wonder what percentage of film crews you can bring in because the only reason to do a tax rebate like that would be so you would use their film crews or their film equipment or you know like something it seems like not just go there and shoot in their interesting looking deserts and then leave yeah they want you to bring money and leave it in that country that's typically how it works exactly so i get it i'm not like crapping on any filmmaker that would want to go do this but it does sound possibly uh dangerous is that sound is that a horrible way to put it yeah Yeah. (laughs) like Uh, especially you know there's a lot of other states that have tax incentives going on there's a lot of other places you could go where you could earn some credits you don't necessarily have to go to the other side of the world but maybe if that location is exactly what you need then uh you'll end up over there too and collecting that 40 percent. but man you know people love to talk about you know safety in the in the in the film industry and i will say that everyone wants safety to be number one but uh, i think safety is often uh, number three it's safety third safety mm. is not uh, and i think that for some people who are looking at boy, we can, we can really stretch our dollar if we go to Saudi Arabia. They might just do that. Yeah, I mean, it, like I, I would want to know more about what was going on around it because I, I, I hate to be like this, but like, you know, if you had a bagel afternoon on Ramadan, are they going to throw you in jail? I, I just don't know. <sighs> God, I, I could see all kinds of incarcerations uh, happening if uh, people behaved like uh, typical Americans. Like Americans. And, and if, if you yeah, had, exactly. If you had a female driver. You, you, you know, like, what are you going to do? So I would love it, honestly, if anybody uh, listening to the sound of my voice knows more about this, set us straight. Let us know, because I don't want to be... That would be great. I don't want to be uh, stereotyping Saudi Arabia, again, a country I know very little about, but it seems like a place wrapped with the kind of religious fervor that might run afoul of liberal Hollywood artsy types. That's just my humble opinion, and uh, I would love nothing more than to be proven wrong and to find myself on a set in Saudi Arabia having the time of my life in just a few months' time. I think that would be great. Uh, I think that's a great place to leave it. And now let's get to the interview with the creative team behind Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul. Here we go. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. Uh, I'm joined now with twins, Adama and Adane Ibo, and uh, they are the creative team behind Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul. Thank you so much for being on the Cinematography Podcast. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Tell our listeners a little bit about your movie. What's this movie about? Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul is a satirical, dark comedy, part faux documentary uh, about the first lady of a Southern Baptist megachurch and how she and her pastor husband are attempting to rebuild their congregation after a massive scandal. And and tell us what you did on the movie. What was your role and how you uh, collaborated? Definitely. Uh, it's Adama speaking. I know Adana and I sound very similar. Yeah, we do. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I was the writer and the director of the film. Mm-hmm. And I, Adana, was one of the producers. All right. And have you guys worked together many times before or was this a first for you? Uh, we've worked together our entire life. You know, we worked to get out of the womb together and it's been <laughs> off the, the race since then. But even like in other things, like we were, we played softball growing up for many years and I was catcher and she was pitcher. Adama was catcher, not I was pitcher. We were, we played tennis as well. We were doubles partners. So it's always been a partnership. Yeah. Nice. Oh, well, that's good. I'm glad that you guys can work together because many siblings cannot. Many siblings can't do that sort of thing, especially, I mean, you've probably got your moments where you're feeling a little bit uh, combative, but I assume you guys uh, want to keep it going. You want to do it again? This this wasn't the last time? No, <laughs> not the last time. Um, I don't think it could be the last time, even if we wanted it to be the last time. It's just, it feels more unnatural not to to work together. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Well, talk about the process of this movie sort of coming to be. Uh, I mean, uh, it all started with an idea. Do you guys have any sort of connections into this world that you uh, portray in the movie? How how did you make this movie turn into reality? Yeah, definitely. I mean, very strong connections to what's being represented. We grew up Southern Baptist in Atlanta, Georgia. 
sort of like in the height of, of what seemed to be like the height of the megachurch culture. Mm-hmm. And very quickly and very early in life, I think, started to become disillusioned with it. Uh, I, I think more than anything, we we had a lot of questions and we found that our questions were met with a whole bunch of resistance rather yeah. than answers. And as we grew older, realized that a lot of those answers revolved around unchecked power. And that's why I wasn't getting answered. Yeah, it's a really funny satire. And you have such clear, big personalities that are inside of this and and the backstabbing and uh, false sincerity, which permeates the whole movie is, I don't know if it's, I would say a trademark or, or something that is like, that is really uh, distinctive in it. But can you talk at all about your experience? Did you, did you feel that insincerity when you were in this mega church sort of culture? Or is it something that uh, you feel like under the surface, less overt, and you're bringing out in the, in your movie? Oh, that's a good question. It definitely, for, for me personally, Adama, it felt like whiplash. There were moments that felt like there was not a ton of sincerity going on. But then there were moments that felt completely real and completely true and completely beautiful. And I think it was that dichotomy that we grew up with that pushed us towards this tone. There are certain things I think that I definitely took some artistic liberties to satirize. Um, but a lot of it is just how, how Black folks go to church. <laughs> I got you. Hey, you know, I just actually realized actually that uh, your cinematographer, Alan, is here with us. And I <laughs> I was like, there's this guy on camera and I didn't know I was also talking to the to the DP. So this is wonderfully fortuitous. So, Alan, hey, uh, help me with your last name. Is it Gwizdowski? Did I Perfect. do okay? Yeah, that's it. Man, and I- everybody calls me Gwiz for short. Gwiz, tell me, how did you connect up with the Ebos the here and how did this union come together to make the movie? So I actually was not the original DP slated to shoot this movie. It was someone that I had worked with several times, Adam Bricker. Basically, my name was tossed into the hat when Adam Bricker became unavailable with a scheduling conflict. But I had worked with Adam on several projects that were in the faux documentary world. So he knew that I was someone that could step in and really take the reins on this type of production where it was It has the traditional style narrative, but also a documentary as well as fake documentary, which those, they seem similar, but they are two different worlds um, trying to tell a a true story versus make it up from scratch for the fiction version. Definitely. I will say that like, as stressful as it was at the time to have my DP become unavailable, it felt like divine intervention to have Wiz be part of this. Like I, I couldn't have asked for a better DP with the best temperament and so patient um, and also just incredibly so engaged. Yeah. Well, well, that's all incredibly flattering. <laughs> I mean, that's uh, for, for Gwiz. I mean, that, that, I mean, that, I'm that, just that, a tad that, bit obsessed with Gwiz. That's the, <laughs> that's the <thing. laughs> Well, Adam Bricker is a good friend of the show and, and we like him very much. And I'm, I'm sorry that he wasn't available. But, you know, sometimes those sorts of things create new opportunities. And, and Gwiz, you were able to step right in and shoot a fantastic movie. Can you talk a little bit about the stepping between the worlds, which it kind of it flows very seamlessly sometimes, sometimes even shot reverse shot between the world of what's going on, not on the re- documentary reality and then the documentary reality look or version of, of the whole movie. Can you talk about the uh, the differences between them? Yeah, well, we knew right off the bat that there are these two different worlds that we need to visually show what they are. They have to they have to make sense. People need to understand right off the bat. Um, is this portion of the film documentary or is this portion behind the documentary kind of the real life moments that they don't want the documentary cameras to see? So we knew we had to separate those two looks right off the bat. And we really chose to do that within the camera as much as possible. And since we were in this documentary world, uh, we wanted to basically set rules to keep ourselves in line with what would actually happen if you're shooting a real documentary. For the most part, you're only going to have so many lighting tools that you might use for the interview. Whenever it comes to like the follow documentary or the the on fly kind of stuff, you're not really setting up lights or lighting those scenes drastically. So it needed to feel natural and real. And while keeping these two separate uh, portions of the film, we needed to have that that through line to where it didn't feel like it was a completely different world whenever we stepped out of the documentary. So we really wanted to use the lighting as something that was congruent throughout the entire picture, but then using different lenses and different color grade, uh, as well as different kinds of motion for the documentary versus the traditional narratives. So we basically went with, for the documentary, we, we kept it handheld for the most part. Uh, we used spherical lenses and we cropped it into a 14-9 aspect ratio to keep it a little a little closer to the the sermon footage, which was 
natively four by three, the SD footage that was, we shot that on a real beta cam that the, the church had. And then we went for the widescreen anamorphic look with uh, what we were calling the cinematic portion of the, the film, which was non-documentary behind the documentary cameras. So we, we chose to keep the two different looks in camera as much as possible. I, I think you really succeeded with them too, because you, you, you very clearly instantly get the look, but you're right with the lighting. It is very congruent. It, you, you really can step between them very quickly where you realize what's happening sort of behind the world and what's happening on camera. And I got to say that this is an incredibly intimate fake documentary. You don't have a lot of, you don't have a really large cast you get to sort of like be with these people all the time, just like it was a, like a reality sort of documentary sort of crew that's there. And I'm sure that this was being made during the pandemic. And I kind of feel like you almost couldn't ask for something more perfect with the pandemic because you could have very few actors in the same place. Can you talk a little bit about just the logistics? And, and I'll open this up to all of you, the logistics of making a pandemic movie and maybe how you navigated the waters because it, it feels feels so natural the way that you did it. It doesn't feel like, oh, you know, we had to change everything because because of, you know, of COVID. It feels like you guys found something that fits perfectly that could be made while this is going on. The only thing else I could imagine would be like something where everyone's wearing like a hazmat suit the whole time. So this is really brilliant. So it's, it's really, really done well. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it was always, you know, I, I went to film school and I'm used to making like independent films, mostly shorts for no money. And so for my first feature, I was like, I'm going to write something that I know I can actually make. Yeah. Uh, and that's producible. That's something that's actually producible. And oftentimes, as a, as a first film. For sure. sure. And, and oftentimes that's with limited everything, like limited cast, you know, limited, like you don't have a ton of background and all of that stuff. And so I, when I wrote this, I knew I was going into it. I went into it with the intention of making it um, a character study more than anything else. And so it was always going to be that uh, even before the pandemic hit. And mm -hmm. so it wasn't too tough to um, to adapt. Yeah, I don't know. I, making it during the pandemic was, uh, it was hot. It was tough to wear the <laughs> mask. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We shot in June and July in Atlanta. So it was gorgeous. <laughs> um, Those are the hottest but, months in Atlanta. <laughs> they really are. <laughs> it really, it truly is. I, you know, we had to work around Sterling's schedule because This Is Us was coming quick. Yeah. Um, but, you know, other than that, it, it didn't feel like it hindered the, the creativity of the film at all. Yeah, I agree with that. And one thing that we were able to get from the church was the existing footage of the, the full church with all the congregants in the actual space that we were shooting in. So we didn't actually have to uh, besides uh, a, a few selective shots where we had maybe 20, 30 extras, that was the max that we had to, to use to fill up the church. Any of those wide shots where there's thousands of people there, that was existing sermon footage that they had. Yeah, I would have been hit drums. They would have, yeah, we wouldn't have been able to do that. I wouldn't have been able to do that. Well, to me, I thought that was brilliant because you had all of the, I mean, th those are all flashbacks in the story. And, you know, it, it's, of course, the story of this Baptist ministry that's fallen from grace, that's had this scandal. And, uh, you know, you got to see the the giant empty room. And then you also get to see, you know, by contrast, the, the stock footage, which is not even stock footage. It's actually from the same place, which is which is what's brilliant. I, I mean, w was it easy to get buy-in from, from the church to do something? like this, I have to imagine that they might be hesitant about, uh, you know, a satire, you know, about this sort of topic and possibly lampooning what's going on there. But you you found some people who are willing to participate. How, can you talk about that at all? The yeah. church was actually all in. We actually shot Hawk for Jesus, the short film at the same church. And it was a church that we knew growing up being from the area and had been too often. And we also knew that Oprah's show greatly shot there. There's all types of mess in that. There's like insects, all types of... We're like, if they let Greenlee shoot over there, they it could be okay. Should be yeah. okay. <laughs> um, but they were like wholly supportive of us. And they, yeah. they were like, you want more footage? We can give you everything. You know, it was, it was, they were really, really helpful. I think, I think it also helped that this, this short found a bit of success and, yeah. they, and they were super proud of it. But, yeah. you know, they, I, I think more than anything, like people in, in Atlanta are just eager to be helpful, especially to, to one of their own, because they, they, do, they just really wanted us to succeed. Yeah, I, I definitely, I've, I've been to Atlanta a couple of times and met several people in the filmmaking community there. I really feel like there's a, an attitude of trying to support homegrown filmmaking and really kind of like going above and beyond for the locals because so much of the the business there is, you know, Hollywood or New York transplants who are showing up to use the facilities and then disappear. So yeah. 
Well, tell me what the reaction's been like so far from the premiere. Have you been getting uh, some good responses or, you know, people uh, reaching yeah. out to you? Yeah. yeah, we've been getting some good responses. It's, it's funny, we haven't been able to dig into it completely. We've been mostly going off of word of mouth, like what our agents and various people in our network and our community are, have been telling us. And so far, I think it's being received well. We're getting a lot of excited, congratulatory emails. I have like 50 emails in my inbox right now. So yeah. <laughs> and even the, I think even the things that we've heard that are like, people don't necessarily jive with it completely. It, it's the things that I think I expected. It, yeah. Um, and and it's, it's the things that I wanted to call out to be, to be honest with, with the film. So I'm all right with it. We think it's doing its job. Nice. So Gwiz, how about you? I think that every time we dedicate months or years of our lives into a project and then you get to see it for the first time in its finished form out into the world, did you get exactly what you wanted to get to? Is there stuff that you look at and go like, man, I wish I would have done it this way. How satisfied with you are this movie now at the end, now that you've seen it? I think I'm, I'm very satisfied with how it turned out. I think the big question for me was with mixing these two different styles, is it going to make sense to everybody else the way it makes sense to me? And for the most part, I haven't had any feedback that was questioning what we intended. So that's really a testament to me as, as far as like how successful we were was trying to get that point across. Yeah. Uh, I think I would have gotten a lot more questions on like, what did you mean by doing this or the changing aspect ratios and all that stuff if it didn't make sense. But I think we pulled it off. So I'm pretty happy. I, I agree. I want to ask you about the color palette, though, too, because this is a very saturated movie. There's lots of like bold colors and there's these really, you know, uh, there's really fun wardrobe and stuff for you to play on as a cinematographer. When you're getting into when you're getting into the shoot and especially then in, in the grade, talk a little bit about how you wanted to represent all the color that's going on in the and the, the costumes and the scenery and everything else. Well, we knew uh, right off the bat, the costuming, having bright colors and the references that Adama had shown me, that was one of the the first intentions that we wanted to keep was just like really showcasing those bright Sunday's best outfits, the really stylized and cool colors and everything. And with the the different grades that we did with what we were calling documentary mode versus cinematic mode, documentary, we, we went for a, a more vibrant digital video look to it, really wanted those colors to pop. And then when we were going into the the cinematic mode, which is behind the documentary, we wanted to to really mute the colors a little bit and kind of bring the seriousness back into it. But then there are points where we needed those two images to contrast with each other, but then other points where we wanted it to blend and really start to, to mix the formats. So at that point, you weren't distracted by the different tools that we're using to tell the story that you'd more so just get lost in the performance. So by the time the, the climax of the movie is happening, we kind of mix the two styles. And then specifically in the last scene, the color grade goes back to being very vibrant when it's documentary and then gets more muted and desaturated once it snaps back into the, the cinematic mode. Well, I think that that is actually a really great place for us to leave it. I want to thank Adama, Adane, Alan, all of you uh, for coming on the show and giving us a little bit of a window into uh, Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul. Thank you all for being on the program. Thank you for having us. All right, so that was the creative team behind Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul. That's out in that's like out in theaters right now, like the I, I, old, sure. old like old times. <laughs> it is. Uh, there's a few things you can see in the theater right now, and uh, that is one of them. So uh, go check out Honk for Jesus, Save Your Soul. And now, short ends. So Ben, it is our famed short end time of the show. What is your right. obsession this week? What are you all about? I, I think I have a doozy. Mm. Uh, I, okay. I really love it. It is a podcast. Okay. So, uh, you know, Shocking. strap in. Yeah. It's a podcast called Pretend. I, I first heard about it mentioned on another podcast that I listened to called The Gist. And Pretend is a podcast. It's like a true crime documentary podcast hosted by a guy named Javier Leba. And it is about con artists and uh, people who pretend to be other people. And he is in the middle of doing a six part piece about Frank Abagnale. If you don't remember Frank Abagnale, he was the subject of the movie Catch Me If You Can, mm. the Steven Spielberg movie. Frank Abagnale was played by Leonardo DiCaprio, and he's this world famous con man who impersonated and like before he was twenty, impersonated like a college professor and a head of surgery and a airline pilot and all these things and and like this 
uh, you know, is like this world famous scam artist. And then he gets caught by a fictionalized person uh, played by Tom Hanks in Catch Me If You Can. And then eventually hired by the FBI mm-hmm. to help them catch other people like him. Now, what would you do if I was to tell you that this podcast easily proves that literally none of that ever happened? <laughs> Zero. Wow. Zero of it. Wow. The, the um, time period that Frank Abagnale claims he was doing all of his most interesting exploits, that entire time, he was in jail. <laughs> and le- and unless he's just such an incredible escape artist that that was someone else serving time for him and he is off doing those things. Uh, basically, this guy, to this day, gets like 15k per speaking engagement oh and, he, my God. and he speaks around the world you know dozens maybe hundreds of speaking engagements per year a, making a nice living speaking about his hilarious scampish exploits he was on the tv uh, game show to tell the truth he was interviewed by johnny carson oh my god um his story is i gotta say a very interesting story even though a hundred percent of it I'll go ahead and say 99% of it is just made up of whole cloth. The real genius of him was making up this myth of himself as a famous con artist. And this podcast takes him down one step after the other. It is so good. And the, the host is kind of almost gleeful. And they tease it at the beginning of the show. And it really does happen where he does an ambush interview with Frank Abagnale after a speaking engagement at some convention. And uh, it's like eating a cheesecake. It's such a good podcast. And I think it's really interesting because, you know, Frank Abagnale, if you know who Frank Abagnale is, like if you saw Catch Me If You Can, which it's been like 20 years since that movie came out. A lot of people have seen that. I mean, I I know I saw that. I saw it in the theater, but a lot of people saw that. It's a wonderful movie and it's beautifully made and brilliant. And, you know, DiCaprio is great. Tom Hanks is great. Spielberg, always great. Shot by Janusz Kaminski, always great. Same year, came out the same year as uh, Minority Report. Spielberg had two movies out that year. And uh, what's interesting about it, too, is like, and he goes into this a little bit in the podcast, is like how we just print the myth. The myth is imprinted on all of us. And it was imprinted on us before Catch Me If You Can, but like, I don't think I'd ever heard of Frank Abagnale before that movie came out. Because, you know, he was like, I wouldn't say a pop culture icon, but he was a pop culture curiosity in the 70s you know maybe early 80s but that he was able to milk it long enough and then get a book written and then get the Spielberg movie and then get a Broadway musical based on the Spielberg movie based on his completely bullshit fake non-existent made-up life I I just can't I can't stress enough if you if you like a good true crime podcast check out pretend and you can find like again like right now I think we're about to drop the sixth episode the sixth and final episode of the story to me, also, just like a testament to the power of movies to make us believe whatever the filmmaker wants you to believe. How many people saw, you know, uh, Oliver Stone's JFK and assumed that that was documentary evidence of what Oliver Stone was saying? And uh, I don't happen to agree with Oliver Stone's point of view on it, but, you know, th- there are intelligent people who believe the conspiracy stories that, that are told of that. But I feel like that movie solidified those events in people's minds. And I think that that tends to happen you know the imitation game I, I wonder how many people believe that that's you know basically a documentary about alan turing you know on and on and on and in this case spielberg and dicaprio and company were all basically duped by this jerk into believing this story yeah you know it's kind of crazy once a hollywood biopic movie is made of you know based on true people or based on actual events even if a lot of that is fictionalized it sort of becomes the lore it becomes the lore for whatever it was that uh, that hollywood decided that it was going to get featured and uh, you know every time i can think of there you know biopics you know walk the line or ray or you name it, especially about musicians bohemian rhapsody is a great example because bohemian rhapsody just takes weird liberties with the story that are unnecessarily made up yeah and i can't fault hollywood but i can fault audience members i, I mean look 
Hollywood wants to tell a good story. They want to get butts and seeds. They want to embellish. They want to make a story of someone's life accessible to to everyone. And quite often, th- that's embellishment. That's taking the idea of what happened and said, how sensational can we make this? And how accessible can we make this to an audience? And I think that this podcast, it sounds like it's doing a wonderful job, you know, tearing down the fiction. Now, I'm I'm sold. I want to listen to this now. It sounds... Uh, I knew yeah, you'd it's, like it's, it. It's completely up my alley. It's... it's it, Yeah. Give every all our listeners the name of this podcast one more time it's called pretend and the whole podcast is about people who pretend to be other people but this particular kind of mini series uh uh, in here is all about frank abagnale awesome so Ilya, what is your short end this week you know uh, it's almost becoming a cliche you hear about it so often that cell phones are taking over the the movie industry and you'll see uh, a new phone get released and they'll hire a couple of uh, you know hollywood uh, bigwigs to shoot a you know some sort of test project or something on it and say hey look at this this is proof you know the traditional cinema days are are over and uh, there's a, a number of people out there who are getting excited about a sony Android phone, uh, the Xperia 5.4. And to be clear, the way they spell that is the letter X, Peria, then the number five and a Roman numeral four. So what? it's like... <laughs> I don't, don't, don't if you're if you're not just in the don't Sony make world. me type that oh my god <laughs> it's so terrible uh anyway uh people are making a big deal about it because it's a 6.1 inch screen and uh it will do 4k 120 frames per second on all of the rear cameras and there's three different cameras on there so you've kind of got like the equivalent to the old school one inch two inch three inch a, a wide and medium and tight and I watched the, the video and it's it, yes it's a nice video but uh, once again Hollywood need not worry uh, everyone's not going to get rid of their uh, Alexas tomorrow and go out and buy Sony cameras it's one of those things that y- you know what look Sony's gotten a lot of crap actually about some of their phones but the thing that they do incredibly well is cameras and so what they're doing is they're taking a lot of their camera technology and they're pulling it all the way down to the the high end consumer level this phone starts at a thousand dollars so it's similar to the you know the the Apple iPhones sort of like range of products and, and apple's about to announce an, an, an iphone 14 i think in the next couple of weeks it's september it's, it always seems like it's time for apple to have another constantly having a, a new thing and i'm sure people are going to make a, bit, a bunch of claims about oh my god this camera's incredible and watch out hollywood everyone's going to have hollywood in their pocket now and the, the truth of the matter is is that no matter what people claim no matter what people are saying about whatever that new technology is, there's a certain amount of, of fiction, not unlike that podcast, not unlike pretend. There's yeah. a certain amount of fiction that goes on. There's a lore of consumer technology overtaking professional technology. And the thing is, is that in some areas of our world, this of course has happened with like desktop publishing and, you know, audio engineering and all kinds of things have really like the consumer level products got up to the level of the professional stuff. And th- and that was it. It was it for the expensive analog professional uh, precursors that all got disrupted by digital. At some point, someday that will happen with a phone. It's not happening with the Xperia 5.4, 5G phone. Uh, it's not happening with the next Apple iPhone. But those cameras yeah. and those phones are great for you to own and to make some sort of little something out wherever you want. Or if you want to get slightly more technically advanced, these things are, are wonderful. But the next time you read something about how this incredible bit of technology is, is taking over the world, uh, I, I, I will caution everyone out yeah, there to believe I, it. I mean, so, so, I agree with you. I mean, like, I, I mean, I feel like for filmmakers, you know, like for somebody who was in my situation when I, before I went to film school or whatever, if I had had a phone that could do 4k video in my pocket, you know, you'd be stupid not to make films on it. You know, it, it's, it's, it's good for practice. It's of good course. for home videos. It's even good for, I have heard stories from very legit DPs who needed to grab an insert shot that was going into a TV show and had to be graded and they needed it very quickly and they didn't have the camera. And so they just grabbed it with a phone and they put it into the series and they got away with it. And the fact that you can do that alone is pretty cool. I I can imagine having like, you know, 20 of these Sony cameras, if you're doing a big action movie, like a Fast and Furious kind of thing and having them as crash cams all over the place in the same way that 10 years ago, people were doing the same thing with GoPros. You know, the quality is better than it's ever been but really what that says too is that the professional level cameras the quality is that much better and the one thing that they're never going to replicate i don't care who you are like they're never going to replicate the quality of professional glass you're never going to get that out of a phone 
You know, it's I, I will I will credit the cell phone makers with this, though. I will say that they continue to close the gap. The gap gets smaller, but that's still it's a pretty big gap. It's a pretty big gap for usability. It's a pretty big gap for uh, overall quality. It's a pretty big gap for workflow. There's a lot of stuff. The, and, and ultimately, believe me, if, if it was that good, uh, you know, every TV series would be like, fuck these expensive cameras. We're oh, start absolutely. Filming this on a phone. If it was really that good. Because producers are a cutthroat bunch of people and they want to save money. That's their job. A hundred percent. And uh, yeah, I, I think I've probably even shared the story on this uh, this podcast once before, but I got a, a client, client for a, a very large corporation who bought a lot of really expensive cameras and a member of the company uh, sent an email saying, hey, uh, for this shoot, we're just going to do it all on iPhones because the iPhones uh, have higher frame rates than the professional cameras that you bought. So this is going to be a better experience. And then I had to send them a YouTube video of what the higher frame rate looked like on their iPhone versus the higher frame rates that actually existed in their cameras and said, you know, go back to your executive and show them these videos and tell them which one, you know, which one do they want to pick? And sure enough, of course, they use the professional camera because <laughs> uh, it, it's ridiculous to say that we should throw away all the professional gear just because, uh, you know, this phone has this one feature. And uh, even though it can do that feature, it doesn't mean it actually does it better than the professional gear that they were already using. Anyway, so no. uh, that's just an example. It's like this sort of thing happens all the time. The the marketing works, the story works, the, the lore of, you know, the digital disruption that's happening. And a certain amount of people will believe it every single time. And then uh, if you go to the, the Facebooks or the LinkedIn's and stuff, and you'll see people going, oh, my God. God, this latest amazing greatest thing it's finally happened it's finally you know surpassed uh, but but no it's and it, it really well, hasn't yeah i would like to remind everybody that we had greg fraser on the show to talk about dune but we also talked about how he and Catherine bigelow made a demo video for the iphone 13 that's right and it was part of the whole marketing push was like them making a making a short film with it and you know I don't think Greg Fraser or uh, Catherine Bigelow are going to put their name on something that they think is garbage. Like, you can get good results. I'm trying to remember exactly what Greg said, but I think he was like, you can get good results, but like, you know, I'm not I'm not throwing away the, the high-end cameras. <laughs> not throwing away the Alexa 65. So here I'm going to take this all the way around. I am going to buy this Xperia 5.4. Because it has a feature that some of the other cameras that they've recently uh, released, and this is something very unique and awesome, you can use this phone as a monitor with Sony professional cameras. You can like hook oh, that's it up smart. via a USB-C cable to a FX3, and voila, whiz bang, you've got a monitor. There was even like, I, I, if I recall correctly, some sort of wireless version, but they've got a, a wired, and the wireless version I think has delay, but the wired like little USB-C jumper cable, I've got a little six inch one right here, it might be a little bit too small. But uh, anyway, regardless, uh, I'm really excited about using that phone as an as an inexpensive on the fly onboard monitor for an FX3. So I think it'd be dynamite. And so oh, that's look, interesting. There's more professional stuff sneaking their way in. But once you start seeing like timecode jacks or SDI or other things that come out of a camera, then it'll be time for some other, I think, manufacturers to, to start worrying. Of course, there's sensor size and other things. But right now. It's a beautiful screen, and you can use that screen as an external monitor for a, a camera on the fly or throw the thing on a little gimbal, and voila, whiz bang, Bob's your uncle. I, I, I'm going to end up buying a Sony Xperia 5. I, I know it's going to happen. I mean, I think, I think Red missed the, missed the boat on that when they had their yeah. phone. They really did, and it's too bad because I think that was the intention with the Komodo, and it, it didn't come to pass. And if had they done that, I think it would have been you know gangbusters for them. It's gangbusters for them anyway. That camera is so popular. But regardless, it would have been Good would, have, would have been much even more. So, anyway, well, I think that about wraps us up, Ilya. Uh, where can people find you in the world? God, I, I want to make a joke about like on the side of the road trying to change a tire, but no, you can find me at Hot Red Cameras, HotRedCameras.com. Uh, I spend a lot of time uh, answering uh, phone calls and emails, and uh, you know, hit me up on the the socials if uh, you have camera needs or you're building a studio or have technical questions. I'm I'm happy to help. Ben, where can people find you? Benrock.com. The uh, hopefully soon to be revamped Benrock.com. And uh, you can find all my social medias, links in Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff. Um, hey, let me ask you, has anyone reached out to you and said, hey, uh, I was trying to find the Ben Rock boat company <laughs> motorboat no. company has anyone reached no, out I and said I, I don't think we've had any accidental boat uh 
customers come to me. But the Benrock uh, Boat Company, I think, has been gone since like 2003. It's been a long time. But so, pretty like, safe that no one's going to ever reach out to you then for uh, Benrock hey, Boats. And you know what? I'll tell you what. If uh, the second someone reaches out to me about getting a boat motor or something like that, I'm sending them right to the person who, who was nice enough to let me have my URL from the fine uh, Brunswick company, maker of fine boats uh, that uh, and other marine equipment. If it wasn't for them, I would not have benrock.com. So thank you, Brunswick Corporation. Hey, Ben, who do we have to thank this week? Who should we uh, give some uh, some whoop whoops to? <laughs> whoop whoop. <laughs> As always, uh, Alana Cody, our intrepid, hardworking producer, uh, constantly uh, calling me up and being like, hey, do you want to talk to so-and-so? And I'd be like, yeah, you bet your ass I do. We should thank Kay's Alec Track Chief, uh, from whom every piece of music you heard on this podcast was written by Kay's. Please go to musicbykays.com for the love of God and just send him a message and say he's handsome or something. You, I mean, yeah, do that. Do it's that. been a That's long good. time. Just he is somebody. Handsome. He is take, a handsome he, man. He's, he's, yeah, I'll go ahead and I'll go with you there. Uh, and then last but absolutely not least, Ben Katz, our editor, whose job we made super difficult today. Uh, real huge apologies, Ben Katz. He's also a handsome man. Very handsome. Yeah. All right. So thanks again to all these people who uh, make this show possible. You know, someone was pointing out to me the other day how other cinematography podcasts that they uh, have enjoyed listening to in the past haven't really dropped episodes in a long time. And they were extremely grateful that we have continued to be so consistent. And uh, I got to have to get Alana Cody on like another like, hey, uh, listener mail episode here because we've got a bunch of nice comments that people are coming in saying, hey, thank you for being there, especially as like some of the other shows out there, which I know you know, we're not really in competition with them. You know, you know we're, it's we're not. a big wide field. We can have as many cinematography podcasts as, as the world can handle. I'll tell you, some people are very, very happy and grateful that we're churning them out, making them happen when uh, some of the other well, shows that they listen to have seemed to, you know, uh, bite the dust or gone dark. Or I assume things. that we're just going to be churning a lot because, you know, we're heading into award season right now. So. We are indeed. So we're going to start in the next month or so getting all the really fancy schmancy prestige movies. That's true. That stuff should should be uh, happening uh, relatively soon. So it's it's that time they start it. It's usually here in the fall, end of uh, September, early October. It starts. It yep. starts. So. All right, Ben. So I think that's just about going to do it for us. Thank you very much for listening. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening.